such a powerful way. I just want to take a few minutes to share something. Um, uh, one of the things that is missing in the church today uh, for a kingdom-minded believer. And uh, looking at the time now, time is very, very tight. So um, just give me a few moments uh, to do something quickly. And then uh, I hope that uh, the Lord will move your heart uh, to the right place. So come with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6. I want to share something briefly. But before then, let's read the word of God. When you have the Bible Society around, you have to read the Word of God, isn't it? Uh, yesterday, I was li uh, li uh, watching a particular man preach, and uh, the Bible was never opened. Um, he was preaching from the Word, all right, but uh, uh, you didn't know where the Scriptures were coming from if you were not familiar with the Bible. But uh, I believe that we don't do that here. Okay. So Matthew chapter 6, and uh, verse 1, we hear Jesus saying that uh, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have, not, you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So um, Jesus is talking here about giving to the needy. And uh, Heather has pointed out some real needs of people who need to know the gospel, who need to have the word of God in their hands. And uh, it's spread all over the world. And we have heard how there is a famine of the word of God in several languages. And so it is very, very important that, uh, you know, uh, we realize that, you know, in our joy, in our celebration of the many Bibles that we have, there are others who still can't have a Bible in their local dialect. And it's very important we bear that in mind. Then he goes on to actually tell us about another discipline that actually advances the kingdom. And he talks about prayer from verse 5. And again, he says that when you pray, you must not be like a hypocrite. And so, in your giving, Jesus is saying that your giving must be done in a way that is not meant to be pious or um, ostentatious. It must be something done in private. And then the Lord is also saying the same thing in our prayers. That if you want your prayers to be rewarded, then your prayers must not be done to actually let people see you know, how powerful you are. Sometimes we even use our tongues, you know, to intimidate people. Jesus is talking about stuff like that. You see, and, you know, when you go to verse uh, 9, he talks about our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our focus and our center for prayer, and Pastor Kingsley went through this, is basically to, for the advancing of the kingdom of God. And you and I, our giving, our prayer must be for what? The advancing of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus, knowing that there was one more element that was key to the advancing of the kingdom of God, began from verse 16 to talk about fasting. And then he talks about when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. You know, the same trend. Like the hypocrites. Um, and what do they do? For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But if you want a reward from Jesus, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, and your fasting may, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your father who is in secret will reward you. The first point I want you to know about fasting is that fasting was not introduced like your giving, like your prayer. It is not like uh, Jesus is saying that you should, you must fast. In other words, Jesus is not 
giving the law like the Ten Commandments. Dasha. That is not what he's saying here. He's not saying that. Otherwise, it will, serving him will become legalistic. And Jesus was trying to avoid us following him by purely following rules and regulations. And then he goes on, you know, um, in the same vein, to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, but when you pray, he tells us about the particular way. One thing also he didn't say is that, uh, that uh, if you pray, uh, uh, if you fast, which means that Jesus is again saying that, you know, fasting is not something, um, you know, which is optional, but it is something important. So, it's not legalistic, and it is some, not something you just can live out of your life. It is something that must happen. But what must be the attitude? And he said that, but when you pray, in other words, he is expecting that when you and I as believers want to advance the kingdom of God, want to see the Father's will done, the Father's love affecting the nations, our, we need to be fasting. And uh, uh, so... You know, in looking at, uh, around and trying to define fasting, I came up with this idea. To fast is not only to refrain from eating. That would be a hunger strike. It is to be unable to eat because of a desperate burden to pray for certain things. You know, so you are not eating not because, you know, <laughs> of hunger strike. You know, or you, are, you feel a comfort portion not to eat. But you are not eating... Because there is a burden on your heart for something. It's like, say your, your child is admitted to the hospital and the doctors are giving you some bad news and frightening you. What happens to you? You want to fast and pray for the child, isn't it? You forget about food. You know, the child's issues are on your heart. And Jesus wants us to have the same attitude when we come to fasting. So fasting is not... It's for the lovers of the Lord. People who want to advance the kingdom of God. People who are determined to see the coming of Jesus, you know, propelled into action and come quickly. And so it is very important. And so why should I, or why should you be fasting? I've just had about six. And because of the time, I will whip through in an instance. And I hope you catch up with me. In Ezra 8, 21 to 23, Esther had... Ezra had boasted about how God is great and how God is able to protect his own and how God, you know, rebels against wickedness and people who practice wickedness. And so it was interesting that as they prepared to leave Babylon to go to Jerusalem, they realized that along the route to Jerusalem were bandits and people who are very harmful, who may harm them and attack them. And they were not prepared to go back to the king and say that although our God is great, he can protect us, but we want you to give us soldiers. So he said that they decided to do what? To fast and pray. So sometimes prayer is a, 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 a fasting is a needed impetus for enforcing prayer. You know, when things are, have become very difficult, when there seems to be no breakthrough, then we need to back our prayer with fasting. Another example is in Judges, where the, you know, Benjamin had actually done so much wickedness in, uh, um, in Israel. And the 11 tribes have decided that they will go against Benjamin and put them down because of their rebellious attitude. Now, Two times they prayed, they went, and they couldn't conquer the uh, Benjamites. And then the third time, they decided that they would fast and pray. And when they fasted, what happened? They overran the Benjamites. So sometimes God has given us this means by which we can actually uh, have some spiritual force to overcome and to do certain things for his kingdom, for the advancement of his kingdom, and also in our private life. So when you are facing some challenges, when you can see your way forward, it is very, very important that you begin to
to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit whether it is time to fast. Not only in terms of enforcing prayer, but also fasting actually brings us on our knees. In other words, if we want to actually um, uh, see God have a free course in our lives. Like for instance, if there is a particular sin which it seems to be hanging over you, over you and you, you sense that you need to come to God in repentance, what are the things that you can do is fasting. You see, in every rebellion, in every sin, is pride. And there is nothing more to humble a man than when he lays aside his food to look on the face of God. When a man begins to fast, you know there's, there's some seriousness around it. And it is very important that, uh, you know, we humble. Again, um, fasting is a sign of humility. And we know that uh, God has some chemistry with those who are broken and of contrite spirit. You know, and if God wants to draw closer to a man, he wants to look out for a man who is humble, who is broken, who has got that kind of spirit is what is attracted to God. And in Joel, God advises the, uh, the Judeans to actually, you know, add fasting to their prayers because he wanted to see true repentance come back to Judea. Now, uh, we, we, we can go on, but because of time, again, fasting is to find God's will and God's direction in life. And I was saying it in the first service, and we can look again at, uh, you know, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 and 23 again. I've narrated uh, the story already, so I, I don't want to go back and say too much. But what I want to say is that for most of the time, you know, in some of our desire to get married and stuff like that, you know, uh, sometimes we forget that we need to pray. And I was telling the first service that, you know, in my days when, you know, I was young, you know, there was no desperation to get married. I was just a student. And uh, sometimes we would take about from Friday to Sunday morning, Fasting and praying, not just for, you know, for the woman who will come in, my, but generally to pray for the will of God around us. You know, and as we pray that kind of prayer, I'm not surprised some of the things that happen in the lives of people that I was praying with. You know, and it is very, very important. These days when the people come, they want to get married, and you dare not tell them, go fast and pray and seek the will of God. Because they have already made up their mind. But I believe that these are the days that we need to return to these things so that we can find the mind of God. What is the point? Getting married for two months, you know, and the thing doesn't work. So fasting helps you to humble yourself. The things that normally will not give way when you fast under the leading of the Holy Spirit, it might give way. Not only that, you see, there are, Jesus said, when he had gone in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 17, when they had been uh, to the mountain of transfiguration uh, and he's come back, you know, the disciples that were left were trying to heal a child who was uh, uh, having a particular challenge. Um, and the, the father had brought the child to the disciples. They couldn't. Jesus came in and she was very saddened. And he said, what? Oh, faithless generation. And then he gave a cure an answer to why sometimes, you know, we don't have breakthroughs in these areas. And he says that some of these things don't just go by prayer, but by prayer and what? Fasting. It means that sometimes the forces of darkness have entrenched themselves in particular places that just praying doesn't work. God needs, you need more power. You need more faith to be able to deal with the situation. And for that to happen, I don't know how, why God expects us to do that. But it is the means of grace to tap into the power and the resources of heaven. And so when you declare to God and heaven that you are serious about the deliverance of someone, God will intervene. And one of the things that God talks about in Isaiah 58 verse 6 is that fasting is about, you know, breaking yokes destroying depression, and releasing people who are oppressed. And so, you know, you can look at it in the days of uh, uh, Isaiah as being a physical thing. But 
In our days, we can look at it both spiritually and what? Physically as well. So it is very, very important that we realize that to move certain things, to move certain situations, you need to do what? Pray and fast. And also, you know, one of the things I have grown to love is uh, Isaiah 58 verse 7. That sometimes we need to fast and pray for the poor and the needy. And when you are doing that prayer, the money that, you know, you are saving for not eating, you save and to practically support the poor. And it is very, very important. This is how many of us will set aside time to pray for the poor, even of your hometown? And we have heard that sometimes some of, the, that some of those poverties are related to what? Biblical poverty, because they don't even have the Bible, in order to see the light of the gospel. And it's very important that we line up with God. Sometimes fasting shouldn't be under, uh, because I'm under pressure or because of anything. We read in Acts chapter 13 verse 2, and what Paul and Barnabas and some of the men in Antioch and some of the women in Antioch set aside time to minister to God, ministering to God, worshiping God, praising God. So, uh, you know, there comes a time that the Holy Spirit moves on your heart and he tells you to set aside time. I don't know whether it happens to you from time to time. You, you sense that you need to go somewhere alone and be with the Lord. In times like that, when you mix it with fasting, God begins to do certain things. I'm not surprised that the, uh, we are told that uh, the Holy Spirit came in and spoke that uh, Paul and Barnabas should be set apart for ministry. Because God is pleased when men decide to minister to him, not for anything, but just to enjoy the presence of God. So, why don't we fast in our generation? Just give me a few moments and I'll, 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 I'll be ending. Why don't we fast? I have said that, uh, <laughs> you know, Pastor Alfred, when he came here some time ago and he was speaking, he told us that 65% of the church today don't fast. You remember that? 65% of the church don't fast. And why don't we fast? Let me give you a few reasons. You know, in Matthew 25, 37 to 39, it talks about the ending days. And it says that men will just be lovers of themselves, self-indulgent. In this generation, we love our food. You know, the, uh, we are told that, uh, you know, if you go to, you know, go to uh, Google, uh, um, what is it, obesity, it will tell you that, the, uh, you know, if things go the way it is, and the Lord tarries, by 2050, 60% of men will be obese, and 50% of women will be obese. And so, you know, the reason that we don't fast is that we love our food. Simple, period. The, the other reason why we don't, we, don't, we don't pray is the misinterpretation of Scripture. The first misinterpretation of scripture is that some people think that when Jesus says that, uh, you know, don't fast uh, because the bridegroom is with you. You remember the uh, disciples of John went to Jesus and asked him, why is it that uh, the, the disciples of John fast and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but his disciples don't fast? He says that they don't fast because the bridegroom is around, isn't it? But there, there will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken away. Then they will fast. Now, the reason people don't fast is that they think that the, the time when the bridegroom is not with them is, you know, because um, it's, it's from when Jesus was de uh, died and was buried, uh, it's the days between that and his resurrection. So once Jesus died and is risen again, now we don't need to fast again. You know, and I think people who, who talk like that, who misrepresent the Bible like that, I know that it's because they love their food. That's all pure and simple. Now, <laughs> because what Jesus meant was from the time he ascended to heaven to his second coming, isn't it? But until then, and if you look in the Acts of Apostles, they, uh, the apostles fasted. They fasted. They would go everywhere that they appointed elders. We are told in the... Uh, Acts of Apostle 4.23, that uh, wherever they appointed the elders, they appointed them through prayer and fasting. And then 
when they ordained them, they fasted and prayed over them. Another reason why people don't fast is that in these days, we, you know, the, uh, the faith gospel that people are preaching. You see, that we have made God a magician. You know, uh, you know faith is everything. You know, I believe I'm a faith person, but I'm telling you, God is also relational. You can use God like a vending machine. You need to have some kind of relationship with God. And so faith doesn't, it's, it doesn't mean that you can just go to God and just take anything from his hands. God wants to see your response of love towards him. So it's very, very important you realize that, listen, this faith thing needs to be mixed with biblical authenticity. You just don't say things. You just don't say that uh, you will get anything from God or get everything you want from God anyhow. The next thing is that fear of legalism. In the past, we know that people, you know, uh, hid themselves somewhere, uh, uh, monasteries and so forth, and they pretended they were better than anybody else. You see, you can use fasting as a means of receiving a special favor from God. You don't use fasting as a means of twisting the hands of God. Fasting by its nature is a process of humbling yourself before God. And then God doing what he wants to do with your life. And it's very, very important that we recognize that. And Nikki Gamble has said this. It has often been pointed out that the opposite of abuse is disuse. But he is saying that the opposite of abuse is right use. The fact that people have abused the way of uh, using, misusing fasting doesn't mean that we should avoid fasting. The best way is to fast properly, isn't it? And Jesus has told us that. Some also is because of practical reasons. Like, for instance, those who are not well, and uh, also th those who are uh, uh, working in hospitals like doctors and nurses, um, it is not very practical to expect them when they are actually working to be praying and fasting, isn't it? But they need to be creative about that. So there are some practical reasons why some people don't fast uh, because of some illnesses like uh, diabetes and so forth. When people are on drugs, you need to be very careful. You need to actually speak to your do uh, doctor if you want to fast. It's very, very important. Now, how should we fast? And I'll just uh, quickly go through this um, to show you one or two things that uh, you need to take some practical steps you need to take if you want to fast. The first thing is that it is very important you determine whether this is a, my regular fast or an occasional fast, like Lent, like a, as our church, we declare fast for uh, every year, isn't it? You need to uh, be determined to find out what this is all about. You know, why do you need to do that? Because if you know the type of fast, if it is all of us fasting together, then the church leadership would have given you the purpose of the fast, isn't it? So that is what you are basing your fasting on. And also you need to know, if all of us are fasting together, then we, you need to be made aware that we need to congregate from time to time to pray. And that is very important. But if you are praying alone, then the principles that we have read about comes into play. It must be between you and God. You don't, uh, you know, make your face, uh, have a long face. For people to know that I'm fasting. Jesus says that when you are fasting, actually treat yourself nicely so that nobody sees your front face. They will see a joyous face. Are you with me? It is very, very important we do that. I quite remember Pastor Alfred, again, uh, speaking about some time ago, you, know, you, you need to determine how long you are going to fast. My practical advice to you is that if you are not used to fasting, don't rush into two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you are going to kill yourself. Your body is used to too, eating too much. So you need to begin to let your body learn how to adjust to fasting. Are you with me? And so it is something you need to do gradually. You know, you can fast from, say, you can miss, like today, you can miss uh, lunch and then pray till the following morning. When you have done that, you've done 18 hours. You see that? You know, if you, if you fast from lunch to lunch the following day, you have done 24 hours. You can do that creatively. And as you do that from time to time, you are catching up. And before you know it, your body is adjusted to fasting and you are able to do it without sweat.
please don't go 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the first instant. I have heard of people dying for doing that. And Pastor Alfred tells us a story, and I'll tell you that story. You know, they went for a fasting, to fast and pray. And when they, they, were, uh, they got there, they had decided they would fast for 40 days. Um, so, whilst they went into the, uh, the place where they were fasting, they gave the keys of that pl place to somebody so that uh, uh, the person can keep it until they are ready to finish on the 40 days. They have told the person, we are finishing in 40 days. And then as the fasting goes on, they, they realize that uh, this in the 40 days was too... Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> and so, uh, and when they got to the three-thirds three of the... Uh, uh, one third of the way, they, they decided to convince themselves that God has heard all their prayers. <laughs> so now they needed to go home. But guess what? The guy also had taken the key. <laughs> so when you are fasting, it's very, very important. You decide how long you are going to fast. And make sure that it is within, you know, your ability. Is that okay? Led by the Holy Spirit. You know, and the purpose of fasting should be clear. I've always, I've already said that it shouldn't be pious, it shouldn't be ostentatious. You must look nice. Uh, uh, and when you are fasting, you don't bear grudges. Are you with me? Isaiah talks about pointing fingers. There are some of us who are too much quarrelsome. A bit, I think more fasting will help us because you will stop what? The pointing of the fingers. We need to, you know, during fasting, we need to actually reduce, you know, as much as possible, you know, be open to the Holy Spirit. Short accounts, okay? You know, if somebody offends you, you don't wait till the following day. You know, your husband offends you. He's sleeping. He's looking in the east and you are looking in the west. But you are fasting. Please, it shouldn't be the case, okay? And then when you are fasting, it is very, very important that uh, you look at how you enter into the fasting. When you are entering into fasting, don't just basically cut off just like that. Reduce your food intake gradually, 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 for the first week before you enter into it. Whilst you're reducing your food intake, you're doing also, you're taking more water. You're taking more water to flush your system. And if you did that, you will enter into fasting without even knowing. But some of us, we just grab, grab. We are in the fasting. Okay? Ease yourself into fasting. Is that okay? And when you are fasting, focus on God. When you are, if you don't have time to fast, don't fast. Fasting is not a time you are doing jolly jolly things, you know, thinking about your boyfriend and so forth. Fasting is time to think about God. Is that okay? So the Bible must be the number one thing on your agenda. Okay? It's a time for worshiping. It's time for praising God. It's time for honoring God. It's time for prayer. If you don't have time, don't do it. But if you are doing it, be serious with it. And uh, lastly, when you are fasting, one of the key practical things is that as much as you can, reduce TV watching. Yeah? TV watching. And any distractions. So, let me end by this. What are the benefits? And uh, that's what you can look at Isaiah 58, 8 to 9, and 11 to 12. And I don't have time so I will just go through it quickly. First of all, it talks about that in verse 8. You know, you will receive light from God. You know that when light comes, darkness goes. Because darkness has never comprehended what? The light. And so fasting brings the light of God into our life. Verse 8 of Isaiah 58. Health comes. Some of us, we get sick before we start praying. But God wants us to live wisely. When we fast, God gives us the keys to healthy living and trusting God for a healthy lifestyle. So that comes in. And also, you, uh, he, um, there's, there's eight again, our righteousness. And I'm saying that impacted righteousness. That as we, we are fasting, God is giving us an increase in the ability to resist him and live for him. And as we do that, our righteousness will increase. increase. And we, are, we know that in Romans 5.17, the Bible says that we reign through righteousness in Christ Jesus. The more righteousness that takes place in your life, the more of the grace of God 
that take, comes into your life and you are able to reign in life. Sin will have no dominion over your life. And the glory of God will increase over your life. How many of us want the glory of God to increase over our life? That is how you go about it. The glory of God will increase over your life. And the next thing I like, verse 9, you will have answers to prayer. Have answers to prayer. Not only that, you will have continual guidance. God himself will guide you. And then you will be satisfied and be content. Because when God meets your needs, what else do you need? You will be satisfied and content. God will establish the work of your hands. And finally, he will restore you and bring renewal into your life. Verse 12. So it is, you know, I've said that be mindful that it is the Lord that chooses how to bless you when we fast. We don't twist his arms, but he opens his arms, as, uh, his hands as a generous father. You know, and in the, in, the, in the morning when I was ending, I said this. In uh, Matthew chapter 9, when the uh, disciples of uh, John and of the Pharisees went to Jesus to ask why his disciples don't fast, the answer he gave was in the environment of, you know, a bridegroom and his guest, isn't it? Now, he said that they don't fast, you know, because I'm around. But there's going to come a time I will not be around. And that time, you know, you will fast. You see, so the fasting are for those who love the Lord. Are you with me? The fasting is for those who are passionate about the things of God. Fasting is for those who want to see the advancement of the kingdom of God. Fasting is for people who want to see Cambodians come to know Christ. Fasting is for those who want to see Ethiopians receive the Bible. Fasting is for those who want to see transformation in the British society. God to come back and reign in this land. And when you have that passion, you will go on your knees to pray and to fast. May God richly bless you and cause you to receive his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we rise for a moment? And as we stand, maybe you have never attempted to fast before, maybe because of some illnesses in your life. Today, I just want to, you to open your life to the Lord, that uh, you are hearing about fasting, and you want to be able to uh, partake of it, and uh, you want God to help you and uh, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, show you how to go about it. And you are asking the Lord, you know, particularly if you have any ailments, ask God to come in and create the conditions to be able for you to be able to fast. And uh, so ask the Lord to give you an insight into his heart around fasting. Pray now with me. Open your heart now to him. Ask the Lord to open your heart to this whole thing about fasting. And ask him to lead you and guide you by his Holy Spirit. And touch and move over your heart. And I want you to pray also that you will take prayer serious in your life. I recognize that sometimes when we call, uh, every Friday when we come here to pray, I've never seen some of your faces here before. But you are praying this day that, Lord, I realize that one of the ways of advancing your kingdom is praying together with my brothers, fasting together with my brothers and sisters. Right now, move over my heart and help me to commit myself to prayer to see the advancement of your kingdom and the advancement of your kingdom in my life as well. Would you do that? Thank you, Jesus. 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 Father, thank you that when we pray, you hear us. And thank you that right now, you are beginning to move in our hearts and create a hunger and a thirst to seek you in prayer. 
and in fastings. We know that you have heard us because we have prayed in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And God people shall say, Amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much. It's offering time. Offering time. Offering time. Please. Um, you know what we do here. Um, if you are giving by gift aid, please uh, take the yellow envelope. Otherwise, take the, um, the white envelope. Ties and offering. Take time to prepare it. If you are paying by a card, uh, you know the, the long stretch of the credit card number, I think 16 digits. Make sure that you fill it, date it, put your name there, put your phone number, just in case uh, something uh, is amiss, we can get in touch with you. And also, don't forget uh, to put the start date and the end date on the card. Okay, Minister Cheko, are you ready? Okay, then. Shall we pray as we take the offering? I'll give you a couple of minutes as we uh, pray and as you prepare. Father, we invite you to come and spread over this whole atmosphere the grace of giving that we will give from the heart. In Jesus' name, and God people shall say, Amen.
thank you for the uh, grace of giving, that we are able to give from what you've given to us. And Lord, we are asking that uh, you will expand our base from, from which we can give more because of taking responsibility to bless you this afternoon. May you increase giving in this ministry in the name of Jesus. And Father, right now we call upon you to give us as leaders wisdom to use the resources that you give to us in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, and God people shall say, Amen. I just want to um, uh, remind you of the, uh, uh, your gift, his joy, the four pounds um, scheme that uh, Heather talked about. You can give four pounds, eight pounds, 12 pounds, 16 pounds, 20 pounds, and uh, you can go on. It's very important. Don't forget. Um, Come on before I. Good afternoon, church. Amen. So, for this week's announcements, Easter, there will be a service on Good Friday, 29th of March, from 10 a.m. to 12:30. Um, we'll also hold the usual family services on Easter Sunday, which is the 31st of March, 2013. Please remember to invite friends and these celebrations. Um, to these celebrations as we remembered what the Lord has done for us throughout our lives. Integrity Conference. The dates for this year's Integrity Conference are Wednesday the 24th to Sunday the 28th of April 2013. Further information will be given after the service, so please look out for this. And I believe that we've got some, um, some brochures at the back, so please do well to pick one up before you leave. New Members Induction Sunday. Um, there's another opportunity for you to um, join the um, New Members Induction Sunday. Uh, which will be held in Porter Cabin A next Sunday between 12 and, e sorry, between 11 a.m. and 11.50, and then after the second service between 10 past 2 and, and 2.40. Refreshments will be served at these meetings. Revival Hour. Revival Hour takes place every Tuesday between 12 to 2 p.m. in the church auditorium. It is a time to gaze in the beautiful face of Jesus and to pray for God to revive our nation our communities, our families, the youth, and to revive ourselves in the power of God. Please do come if you are available. Church building use. This is a notice to anyone that uses the church building. The church auditorium must not be used if there is less than 50 people gathering for a prayer meeting or any other meeting. Instead, please try and use the church foyer, the church house, quarter cabins A or B, um, and also, before the meetings are booked, you'll need to collect a booking form from the foyer um, and return that to the church office. The forms would have to be signed and approved by the head pastor, sorry, by your head pastor before the meetings are held. Thank you for working with the church in order to save money. God bless you. And finally, is there anyone who is worshipping with us for the very first time today? If this is your very first time worshipping at Trinity Baptist Church, can I please ask you to raise your hand? Please, if you just wave to me to say hello, we just want to welcome you. Any new faces for the first time? No? Well, God bless you all. It's great to see you all again. And we, from the head pastor and the church, we wish you all a wonderful week. God bless you all. Thank you. You know, can, can you put on the uh, video for uh, the conference? Quickly, please. God rules over all. God rules over all, and it's that time for his kingdom to fill our minds. Trinity Baptist Church, London, brings Integrity Conference 2013. Theme, the kingdom-minded believer, from Wednesday 24th to Sunday 28th April, 10 a.m. in the mornings and 7 p.m. in the evenings. Speakers, Reverend A.N. Stackhouse, Pastor Eastwood, and host Pastor Kingsley. Watch out for an Integrity Youth Showdown on Saturday, 27th April. Music, Clarion Clapwood, Sonny Badu, TV Sequa, and Chosen Generation. Venue, Trinity Baptist Church, 2 Thunder Road, London, SE27, OSA. Call now, 0208-766-7732. Website, trinitybaptist.org.uk. Integrity Conference 2013. See you there. Okay, so 
God rules over all. You know what to do. Make sure that uh, you pick uh, one of these. And uh, it's very important that we all prepare. I think last week, Pastor told us uh, that uh, Pastor Eastwood will be speaking on his latest book, on, uh, which is uh, titled Envy, and how it staffles the work of the kingdom of God. So I hope that uh, we'll be prepared and ready. Shall we rise as we share the grace together and as we get ready to go home? Thank you very much. Um, God bless you. Hold somebody's hand and begin to... Uh, God loves you. Tell your neighbor, God loves you. I love you too. This week, may God richly bless you. Increase you on every side. Everything that you touch, may it prosper. May God take you to your office, to your job, and bring you home safely. Everything that you put your hands to do, the Lord will bless it and increase it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God richly bless you.